church. How are you all doing this morning? Good? You're excited to be here. That's great to hear. Well, I'm Pastor Graham Hunt, and I want to be sharing my heart with you this morning. And the way I want to do that is I want to share my life verse with you. And uh, it's, it's a verse that I've had in my life for a long time, number of years. It's been with me through many ups and downs. Uh, it's encouraged me. It's inspired me. Uh, but probably more than anything else, it's actually really challenged me in life because it's, it's a verse that, that desires for me to be the kind of man that God wants, that I believe God wants me to be. Uh, and so we're going to look at that this morning. And I think many of us as, as people, you know, we might not have a life verse, but some of us might have, you know, a life motto. Some of us might have a life quote uh, that kind of gives us a vision and a purpose for something that we desire to accomplish or for the kind of people that we want to become. And, you know, one of the more popular life quotes that are out there today is a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. And it's a quote that says, be the change you want to see in the world. And it's, it's a fantastic quote because we realize that in our world, uh, our world is a world that is broken, that we know and recognize that we need to see it changed. And we realize that we are the ones that can actually get up each day and go out in the world. And by the things that we do with people, the things that we do in the world, is we can impact our world and make a change. And so that's a great uh, quote that inspires us to get out there and to do something. Um, you know, one of the great uh, quotes I've heard that maybe isn't quite so inspirational, but says, always remember that you're unique, just like everybody else. Uh, and so that's a good one. Uh, but you know, not, not only just do we as people have those mottos or quotes that we live by, there's a lot of companies that are out there that have uh, taglines like that, or maybe we call them slogans. Uh, so Nike, what would be Nike's slogan? Just do it, right. Or McDonald's, what would be McDonald's tagline? I'm loving it. Yeah, you got it, right? You know, for me, though, when I think about fast food, my first choice is definitely not McDonald's. Uh, that's not the first place I desire to go to or, or want to have an experience at. And so my personal experience or my reality with McDonald's is probably more a little bit like I'm not loving it when I go in there and step into that store and into that place. Uh, you know, and you might have that experience with some other companies or other places that you go to. Uh, so I want us to throw up some of the company's uh, slogans that might be a little bit more like a reality for us. So here we have Ikea. We throw in extra parts just to mess with you. For any of you that have shopped there, you know what I'm talking about. You probably had that experience. Uh, the next one, throw that one up. Coffee Mate helps you pretend to like coffee. Uh, you know, it adds that flavoring so you can get past the bitter taste. The next one there, Apple computers, $2,000 Facebook machines. Some people might use it just for that. Uh, the next and last one here, Netflix. Spend more time searching than actually watching. Uh, and those of you that have Netflix, you share that experience or that reality with that product or, or that company that you have that experience with, uh, which is a, a great thing. Now, my sermon this morning is entitled Immovable. And what I want us to talk about or have this concept of is uh, we have our lives, right? And we get up each day and our life is a life that we desire to want to see good things happen, great things happen. And we're kind of on our way and, and trucking about. But we realize that outside of our life, there's circumstances and situations that come into that sphere. And it's sometimes circumstances and situations that we don't like because we're people who like to control things, right? We like things to go our way, uh, to happen the way I want them to happen. And we struggle and we wrestle with this concept of these things coming in that make us people who are immovable because those things, more often than not, probably change the, my attitude, change the way I think about things, my emotions, might even change the way that I view myself or that I think about God. And so it's this concept that we don't want to be those people who are immovable in life. We want to work towards being people who are actually immovable. So when those things come, the circumstances, the storms of life, we can be steady and steadfast in people who are immovable in that kind of a regard. So that's sort of what we're looking at this morning. Um, but for me, I am a person who is movable, right? I have not achieved that status of, of being immovable. I get moved by things in life. And one of the things that I get moved by more often than not is driving. And what I mean by that is not that, you know, I get in my car and I drive from point A to point B, but when I get in my car, sometimes in my day, my attitude and everything changes. And what I mean specifically is the merge lane, 
When I come to the merge lane, it drives me absolutely nuts and my body starts doing things and my emotion starts changing because you run into those certain people that in the merge lane, and maybe you're one of them, so I gotta be careful here, and you come to the merge lane and you stop right at the corner and you wait and you look around and yet there's a whole another 30 feet of lane that you could drive into and signal to go into the other lane. And so I'm stuck behind that individual and everything within me wants to rise up and hit my steering wheel or obscene gestures or whatever that's going on. And it's I allowed that situation in my morning or in my day to make me a person who's movable and to impact that thing that's going on for that day. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at my life first. It's Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 to 8. But before we get into that, you can go ahead and open up your Bibles to that if you're following along this morning. But what I want us to do is there's a couple verses before verse 7 and 8. We're going to take a look at that because what it's going to do is there's this sort of portion of Scripture where God gives us a choice. You know, in Scripture, there's a lot of times where God gives us commands to do things. But here's a part where God gives us a choice and sets a couple choices before us. So we'll pull up that verse, Jeremiah 17, verses 5 to 6. I'm just going to read that here. And as I read that, what I want us to do is I want you to think as I'm reading this, what are some of the thoughts or pictures or imaginations that come to your mind as I read this? So it says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. So what were some of those thoughts that were coming to your mind? You guys can shout them out. What were you thinking? Anything coming to your mind? Shout them out. Withered? Withered? Yeah. Anyone else? Probably this picture of a dry place, right? Well, I'll let you know what what comes to my mind initially when I think about that. What I think about is my mother. Now, before you think I'm some horrible son and you think my mother is cursed, uh, that kind of thing, I want to show you my mother's famous award prize-winning plant. And it's just over here. I'm going to give you a a picture of this to kind of help us out this morning. Now, Now, before you think your eyes are failing you, Uh, or you think this is an invisible plant, it isn't. Uh, That is a pot with dirt and a stick in it. You see, growing up in our household, uh, anyone who would bring a plant or plant-like substance into our home, uh, it would die. My mother would kill it. Uh, And if she never got around to it, it would probably commit suicide because that's just what happened in our home. And uh, my mother had the curse of the black thumb. And that's just what she had, and it was her thing. Uh, And so our living room looked a lot like a plant graveyard. It just had all these pots with dirts and sticks in it. And that was our home growing up. And the wonderful thing about that is, as a child or as a son, Uh, You know, the mother would always come and talk to the kids saying, you know, you can't play ball in the house or I don't want you to wrestle in the living room because something's going to get broken and destroyed. And so because my little brother and I are horrible kids and we're absolutely rebellious, we would never listen to that and we would go and do whatever we'd want and play in the living room. And the great thing about that is, is anytime you would knock over one of the pots with dirt in it, all you had to do was scoop the dirt up, put it back in the pot, put the stick back in its place, maybe grab the vacuum cleaner and and vacuum up the rest of the evidence, and my mom would have no clue what had gone on. She would be none the wiser that we were messing around and something got knocked over. You know, the whole time in my life growing up, my mother never came into the room and I never heard, what happened to my plant? Because we never had any, we just had pots of dirt in them. Uh, And so that was my experience growing up. And it paints that that good picture, that illustration in our life of what our lives can look like when we choose to put our trust and hope in man instead of God. And so why don't we go ahead and take a look at the next two verses. This this is my life verse 17, verses 7 to 8. I'm going to read it on the screen here. It said, Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the water, which spreads out his roots by the river and will not fear when he comes. But its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So it's just a a great encouraging verse that's really inspired me through life. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a look at two questions that we want to tackle. And the first one is, how do we do this, right? How do we, who who being people that are movable in these situations and circumstances, how do we move from being movable to immovable? And the second question is why? Why do we want to do this? So why don't we go ahead and throw up the first screen uh, on there. And one of the things of how we can move from being movable to immovable is this, is we need to change what we think. And that, that includes our trust and our hope. You see this 
this, there's those two virtues of, of trust and hope. And what we want to do is we want to use those to be able to help us become people who are immovable. And I think that the first uh, virtue there of trust is one that we probably, we get, we understand, you know, we've grown up in a home where we have to trust our parents, maybe trust other people. But I think this concept of hope is a little bit more of a struggle for us to be able to grasp what that really means and what that looks like. So we're going to focus a bit on that concept of hope this morning. Now, hope is, is an interesting word or an interesting concept because as human beings, we're born with this hope inside of our heart, right? We grow up, and it doesn't matter where you're born, what kind of family uh, you're born into, but we're all born with hope. We have the hope to be loved. We have the hope to be accepted. We have the hope for success, the hope for all those things and security in our life. And so we're born with that and those things. And so it's this universal pursuit uh, of hope that we desire for things to be great and wonderful. And I think as, as, you know, those of you that are here this morning that are parents, we understand that we've had hopes like that in our life growing up. But now we have kids and it kind of transitions or it switches from having hope about me to having hope for my children and for their life. And I think for a lot of us, there's the hope that, man, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've made a lot of mess ups and a lot of things that I'd rather go back and take back. And so our hope then becomes, I hope that my children never have to go through the mistakes that I've made in my life or go through those kind of lessons. And it transfers that way. You know, for my for my children, my hope is that they do better in school than I did. Uh, that's a big hope for me because hope, uh, s- school was a big struggle for me and I hope that they do well and become intelligent and, and get successful jobs out of that. And that's one of my hopes as a parent for my children. And hope is an amazing thing because what it does is it desires for things to change, right? We get into certain situations and circumstances and we want those things to get better in our life. And so that's what hope does. You know, hope never, uh, hope never desires that things get worse, right? We'd never go around and say, oh man, I'm in this fantastic situation and I just hope things go worse. I hope they, that they just all fall apart and things are not fantastic. We never hope for that for ourselves. Now, If we're really honest, we might hope for those things for our enemies or for the people that we don't like, but for ourselves, we would never hope for those things. We always hope for the things that are the best in desiring those things in that way. And yet, hope is such an interesting thing in the way that we we view it in the world, the way that we talk about it, the way that we do those things, because it's almost like we view hope as this birthday wish, right? It's this birthday wish that, man, I sure hope this thing works out, or it's this kind of wishy-washy, unsure of optimism type of thing. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to a hockey game or a football game where they have that 50-50 raffle. And if you buy tickets, I'm sure after you buy, you sit there and you hope, I win. Well, there's really no power in your hoping yourself to win because there's nothing you can do to change that circumstance. It's 50% you're not going to win or 50% chance that you are. And it's this kind of emptiness of the hope that we have that the world wants to give us in those kind of things. You know, and to be honest with myself, I tend to lean a little bit more towards that kind of hope uh, when I hope for things or want things for myself, uh, if I'm really honest with myself. But then there's the biblical definition of hope. And this is the kind of hope that really uh, lightens our load, that really gives us something to inspire to and to cling to. Because our biblical hope is something that's far greater than the world's hope. It's kind of defined as a confident expectation. We can have confidence in that hope to expect things to work out for the good things that God has for us. Um, Hope is a firm assurance regarding things that are unclear and unknown. Right? There's a lot of things in our life that are unclear and unknown. But what the biblical sense of the hope says, that we can have a firm assurance that those things are going to turn out well and are going to turn out right. You know, there's a a scripture in God's word. It's Hebrew chapter 6, verse 19. I'm just going to read that one here. It says this. It says, this hope, talking about that biblical hope, that, that hope that we have in God and in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. It says that we have that as an anchor of the soul that it's both sure and steadfast and which enters into the presence behind the veil. It gives us this picture of the biblical hope as an anchor of the soul. It's something that's sure and it's steadfast and makes us immovable. And it's that great hope that we desire to cling to. You know, that picture of, of hope as an anchor of the soul makes me think of this old sea captain. And he had gone out uh, to the sea and the ocean with many excursions. And oftentimes in his life, he had ran into storms to the point where he would have to drop his anchor to the bottom of the sea and hope that that anchor 
is going to hold him, uh, make him safe and make the boat and all the men in his boat safe until the morning when the storm would pass. And uh, so what he would love to do is he would walk out on the dock and he would sit on this one bench and he would watch as the boats would go by and just reminisce of all the times about where he got to hope in that anchor. And this one day, a teenage boy came along walking on the dock and he had this full head of hair of a mohawk. Now, it wasn't the, the full mohawk that we think about, but it's kind of one of those spiky ones. And each spike had its own color, kind of like a color of the rainbow. It had blue, green, red, and orange. And this boy sat down by the old sea captain and sort of waited there for a while. And he began noticing the old sea captain looking at him. So he looks over and he says, what's the matter, old timer? You never done anything wild in your life? And the sea captain says, yep, got drunk once, married a parrot. I'm just wondering if you're my son. <laughs> and so it's this hope as the anchor of the soul that we really want to cling to that, that firms us and makes us grounded in the things that we hope and desire for. There's a, a portion in my life, you know, talking about this whole desire to want to be immovable where I really wrestled with this concept of hope. It was around the, the time of my life when I was 19 years of age and I had lived at home with my parents and sometimes there's the circumstances and situations in our life that, that, you know, we're doing everything right. Where we're following God, we're reading his word, we're doing all the right things and the good things. Uh, this was not one of those situations. This situation, I was uh, getting involved with the wrong kind of people, just making a mess of decisions and situations that I was making, and I got myself in a pretty big mess. And out of that, because of the decisions I had made and things I had walked into, I really struggled with having hope for all of the dreams and aspirations I had desired for God to, to do in my life and for the kind of man that I wanted to become. And I had really fell into this deep, deep pit of despair and depression for about a year in my life where, you know, I was living at home with my parents and I had just stayed in my room and I'd felt a lot of times just this overwhelming feeling of this numbness just kind of wash over me. And it got to the point in my life where I just really was, you know, I was wrestling with God to the point where I said, God, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I just take me off this train called life because this is just not, I'm going on a path that I had never wanted to walk down or I could have even imagined. And I had wrestled with that. But what had happened was one night God met me. And it wasn't this amazing light or presence that came into my room and it, he didn't speak to me audibly. But what the Holy Spirit did was he took me to a portion of scripture. It's in John chapter six. And it's this portion where Jesus was talking to the disciples and he was teaching some pretty hard things. And a number of the disciples turned away from Jesus and walked away from him and, and didn't follow him anymore. And so he chose to look to the 12 disciples and he said, well, are you going to leave too? And Simon Peter had this amazing response and he said to Jesus, Jesus, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One. And that was his response. And I remember in that moment, feeling like it was Jesus speaking right to me, saying, Graham, are you going to go too? Are you going to walk away? And in that moment, I felt like that response in my heart, like Simon Peter said, God, where am I going to go? What could I possibly put my hope in of anything far greater than who you are? I know who you are. I know too much. And so out of that, God began restoring my trust and my hope in him. And it wasn't something that happened immediately or suddenly, but over the years and over the, the times I began pouring into his word and hearing from him, he began restoring that trust and that hope in my life. And he began taking me on a journey to do those things. So what we need to do to change the way we think about that stuff and, and to become people who are movable is we need to begin to be people who put our trust in our hope in the right thing, to put it in God rather than in man. Put that, that next slide up there because we want to talk about the next thing about being moved from people who are movable to people who are immovable. And I think the next thing that we need to do is we need to change what we do. And it's this concept of being planted by the water. It's in that verse uh, chapter, verse 8 there, it says that we will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. You see, it gives us this great picture of this tree over here. You know, you see it being lush and tall, 
creating shade. I mean, even though it's a fake tree and it really isn't real, uh, it gives us this appearance that this is really the desired thing and what our life can look like when we're planted by the waters. You see, my wife and I, we, we moved into our home and we've been there for about three years and we finally decided and got around this summer to planting plants. And uh, it's been a great thing for us, even though it's been a lot of work. It was a lot easier having the weeds because I didn't have to go out every single day and water them and pick out the weeds and, and take care of them and make them uh, this wonderful thing. And now people that walk down our street actually uh, would probably look at our house and think that somebody lives there, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, but it's been actually a, a, an interesting journey to, to plant those, those plants uh, and to water them because I really actually wish that they would just take care of themselves. If they would just be planted in the right spot, they would just be able to, to get the water from the ground and get the moisture that way. You know, I've been, been really trying hard to do that well. I want to be breaking the generational sins that have been passed down so that I don't have the pot with the dirt and the stick in it. So I'm working hard at that. I think it's going pretty well so far. But what we want to do is we desire to be that tree where that life source is, is, is that water. Uh, but for us, what do, we, what do we do as humans who desire to be those humans that are like that tree is we need to think about what's our life source? Where does our life source come from? So I want to look at John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, because Jesus gives us the answer. So we'll read that there. It says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this, and here's the answer, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we see in this portion of scripture, Jesus talking about those coming to him and receiving rivers of living water. And he says, this he spoke about the Holy Spirit. So when we come to Jesus saying, Jesus, I need you to be my life source. Give me the Holy Spirit. Let him be with me. I want to abide with him and I want the Holy Spirit to abide in me. Because when we do that, he becomes our life source. You see, it's the Holy Spirit in our life that revives us. He refreshes us. That's where we get our life. That's where we get the fruit that produces the good thing, all the healthiness in us and in our life. So that's our desire to abide in him and to be planted in him and where he is. And the way in which that looks like for us in our life is we need to connect with him on a daily basis relationally. That's what being planted by the water looks like. We don't just come and visit for a while and go away and leave, but we abide there and we, we remain there and we remain planted. And that, that looks like for us when we pray when we pray to God, when we pray to the Holy Spirit and commune with him and allow him to speak to us and upon our lives, when we worship him, when we come on a Sunday morning and we praise him for all he is and all that he's done in our life, when we serve him, when we serve his kingdom and when we serve other people and ultimately when we read God's word, when we look into his word and we hear the promises and the great truths and the things that God has for us and for our lives, that is what being planted by the water looks like. You know, I realize when I'm not doing that because when I get in a season where things get busy and we, we are people who are busy and we get uh, a lot of things coming to our life and we miss out on those opportunities to talk with God or to read his word or we're missing out on church for a while. And, we, and for me personally, I realize that I begin doing that a little too much when I start to see fear and worry and anxiety creep up in my life and then I begin thinking about, man, am I putting my, my trust and my hope far too much in myself or in mankind. That's that little indication in my life when the fear and the worry starts coming. Where's my trust and my hope being put in? Because it's not being put in the Lord and in God. You know, when I was in that, that season of, of hopelessness and despair and depression, that's exactly what I was doing. I was isolated. I was in my room. I had abandoned a lot of my friends. And just that, that numbness of things. I was not in God's word. I was not going to church. I was just sitting there by myself all alone. And I was wrestling with God and going through those things. But it's in the desire in those situations to choose to get out of that situation and to plant ourselves by the water where we're connecting with the Holy Spirit, allowing him to speak into our lives. And he does that through so many different ways. So that's what we can do. And that's what it looks like to move from being people who are immovable to desire to want to be people who are immovable. So let's take a look at that second question, why? I think it's a great question because we always want to know why. 
right? Why should I do this? What's in it for me? That whole deal. Um, and so it's, it's that portion of my life verse where it says, it does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't want that? You know, who doesn't want to not fear or to not worry? I think that's a great thing that we should all hope and desire for ourselves. Well, I want to throw up a little picture of my daughter here. Just a little sweetheart there. She's enjoying some ice cream. Um, now, she's, she's turned two years old now. And so what that means is there's things in her life that look a little bit different from the sweetheart. Because that's, that's the, the frozen in moment time, right? Because she's in the, this season of life where it's the mine, mine, mine. Everything's mine, right? And she wants those things and has a difficult time sharing. And so we were having dinner one night. This was a number of weeks ago. And uh, it's, it's great because what we have is we have Emery's plate of food and then we have my plate of food and we have my wife's plate of food. But to my daughter, it's not like that. It's I have my small plate, I have my big plate, and I have my other big plate. Because to her, she gets to eat whatever she wants, whatever is on the table is hers and it's free reign. But one night when we were having dinner, I realized the hard way that that doesn't go the other way around. Because we were having quesadillas, and in our family, we love to have salsa and, and sour cream with our quesadillas. It just makes it taste that much better. And I had, I had used up all my sour cream on my plate, and I looked over, and on my, my little girl's plate, there was this huge mound of sour cream that she hadn't even touched or looked at the entire time. So I, I just took my piece of quesadilla and, and just took from hers and put it in my mouth, and I was just enjoying the lovely taste of a quesadilla and sour cream, and it tasted so good. But then when I looked over at my daughter, she had this terrified, worried look on her face like it was the 1930s and I ate the last piece of cabbage in all the country. Like I had just, just stolen something from her, right? And she had tears streaming down her face. And, and I thought, oh no, what did I just do? And so she gets off her chair and she comes over to me and, and it's this beautiful picture because she has her hands reached out. She's coming over to daddy with tears in her eyes. And I think, oh, I love this. She's coming for me to pick her up and to hold her and tell her everything's okay and it's going to be all right. And so she comes to me like this, but instead of wanting to hug, she sticks her finger into my mouth and starts trying to scoop the sour cream back out. And I, and I think, what are you doing? What's, what's going on in your mind? And so, and so I said, no, you, you can't do that. You know, it's in my mouth. You can't eat that. And so I put her back on her chair and it kind of distracted her and, and so she was eating some other stuff. But in that moment, I kind of thought, man, God, is that not how I respond sometimes to life when I feel like you've taken something from me or I feel like something's been lost or you're withholding something from me or maybe something else, someone else has come along in my life and taken that thing from me? That's often, more often than not, how I feel like I respond to God where I would almost come up to him and stick my finger into his mouth and say, give me that back. That's mine. I want that. I desire that. And so it's, it's the way we react when our hope and our trust is not placed in him. I want to finish this morning with one final story. It's a story about a man who went and visited an orange grove. And during this time, the irrigation had broken down. And this season, during that time, had been a season that things were incredibly hot. And things were very dry. And, and you began to see some of the trees wither and, and die uh, during that season. And there was another man who owned his own orchard. And so he took this man with them. And he showed him his, his own orchard and said, you know, I, I want to show you this, my orchard, because it's, it's thriving and it's doing well. But what I've done in my place is the irrigation is I've made it, uh, I've held it back and I've used it sparingly. And the reason I've done that is because when that hardship comes into that tree's life is it sends its roots down in the soil in search for moisture and in search for water. And so because I've done that, I've managed to have the trees that are the most lush, the most green, the most fruitful trees in all this area. And I know that my trees can go at least two weeks without any kind of water source because their roots have dug down deep into soil searching for moisture. You know, there's lots of times in our lives where we go through droughts like that. And for most, if we're really honest, there's those spiritual droughts, right? Where we feel like, God, I want to hear your voice or I want to feel the sensation or the feeling of the Holy Spirit in me and where that seems like God seems far off or he's far away and we're lacking to have those things for God as, as being a part of our life and we're going through that spiritual drought. And I feel like what God would want to speak to us this morning and to say is that when those times come, God's desire for us is to not fear and to not worry, but for us to send our roots down deep 
in search of the moisture, in search of that life-giving source of what God desires to have for us, to pursue him, to chase the Holy Spirit, to not give up. Because when we do that, our roots dig down deep. So then the next time in our lives, when hardship comes, when circumstances and situations don't look that great, we can be people that are strong, people that are immovable, that we know that our faith and our hope and our trust is placed in God and not in man and the circumstances of our life. And that's what God desires for us to be, people who are immovable. So would you stand with us this morning? This morning, I want to just take a moment, because in a room this size, there may be people here this morning that have never made that decision to make Jesus Christ the hope of their life, where they can have everlasting love and peace and joy. So what I want us to do is I want us just to bow our heads and close our eyes, because I don't want to single anybody out this morning. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're here this morning and you feel like you want to make the Lord, Lord of your life, that you want him to be your personal Lord and Savior, the hope and the trust that you put your, your hope in. You're who I'm talking to this morning. And so with everybody's head bowed and everyone's eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward or single you out. Simply just raise your hand and put it back down so I can see it. And we're going to pray a prayer together. It's just as simple as that. Is there anyone here this morning who would like to make that decision? I thank you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. And maybe you're that person who's walked away from God and you feel like you're in that moment of hopelessness where you've lost hope in who God is and you feel like the struggle to trust him. If you're that person this morning, I want you to raise your hand and say, God, I, wanna, I want you to restore my hope and my trust in you because it's been misplaced. Thank you. Hands going up all over the room. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hand down. Well, this morning I said I wouldn't single anybody out, so why don't we do this? If you raise your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with all your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess I've been a sinner. I've been walking in my own ways. I've been doing my own thing. I've been putting my trust and my hope in man and not in you. But today, everything changes. Because I believe you died on the cross for my sins. That you died and you rose again on the third day. And you forever lived to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Today I'm a new creation in Christ. Today I'm a Christian. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand this morning. <laughs>